uh, he unless he gets fired, they can fire you, but firing a director is difficult and it's messy and nobody likes doing it. So right. they just move shit around. They just move the venue. Yeah, that's they just move and don't tell you where they're going. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So I, I eventually found out. I, I called the editor. The new editor was a guy named George Folsey who was used to run, I think, Universal Pictures. He was a big producer. He made... Um, what was the guy who made uh, Blues Brothers? That director, uh, John Landis. 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 John Landis and he made movies together, and he edited all of John Landis's movies, including the Blues Brothers and all these great comedies. Right. So uh, he took over the editing, and I called him, and he, I was really angry that he was editing without me. And then at one point he said, "Listen, I, this is reality. They gave me the movie to edit. Um, what are you gonna, you know? Let me work on it for a couple of weeks with their concerns in mind, and then." Uh, you can come in and we'll talk about um, and you can look at it. But I'm not hurting your movie. Just you know, he was a really great guy. So we did an edit with me and him together. And he was hurting your movie. No, he wasn't. He actually ended up. He was hired to get it away from my vision, but he ended up liking the way I wanted to make the movie. I I, I converted him, and we did a cut together, which probably got him in some trouble. I I, pre, I like he's a guy I'll never I'll never forget because he did that for me. So why is it so hard to fire a director? Is it just all union it's stuff? Just nobody likes to. You know, it's a part of it is that these a lot of the executives in Hollywood are just fucking pussies. Yes, they don't want to have the moment. I wouldn't mind if I felt like somebody was fucking up a thing that I, and I don't believe it that you shouldn't fire a director. Right. I signed when I made that movie. I signed a reg regular uh, studio contract that says I serve at their pleasure and they can replace me on a day's notice. I knew that, so I can't say they took my movie away. They hired me to work on a movie that I happen to have written and that I care a lot about. But I got thrown off because I wasn't doing what they wanted. That's the way it works. But well, they didn't have the they didn't have the balls to do it. The one point I went to the they hired another editor and then I they flew me out there first class, put me up in a beautiful hotel, and I went to the editor they and the producer on the movie at the time um, invited me to the editing room to watch the reels. You know, movies are cut up into like right. five reels. So I would watch Real One, and then he'd go, thanks for coming. And I'd go, well, I have some suggestions. And he'd go, no, we can't take your suggestions. This is already in the works. Oh. And I'd go, well, what do you, what am, how, what's my input here? And he says, if you have suggestions, you can email them to me later. And I said, but you already locked the reel. And he goes, yeah. So what's the, what will be done with my suggestions? And he said, nothing. He said this to me. And I said, so you're not letting me work on the movie. And he goes, go back to your hotel and email me. Like, he just, he, he flew me out there. And put me up um, just to 3,000 miles just to get fucked and uh, not be allowed to work on the movie. That's something I won't forget either because that was like a, a, like a chess move on his part. Like I couldn't say he didn't invite me. He sure did invite me. Sure. He's got the receipts to prove it. Right, right. I flew him out of your first class. Um, he, went, he put him up in the best hotel in town and all he did was come to the editing room and cause problems. So I had to I, I had to restrict his access, and that's the story he told people, which is not true. Um, so and he basically just said, "Go back. And, I'm, we're here talking, but go back and email me." Yeah, go. But you know, I'm, you're not. You can't sit in the editing room and make suggestions because we're too late in the process. We're locking the reels now. What does that mean, locking the reels? It means that it's picture locked, which means you can't change any frames. That you've you've started to print the film. So he said, "Go back to your hotel room and write write me emails." And I said, "What'll well, be done with them? Nothing, because the reels are already locked." It was like it was just so insulting. And when he did that, I I had the reaction that he programmed that he expected, which was, "I gotta get out of this. Is too personally painful." I mean, I had been working on this. I directed this movie. I was such a emotional thing for me. It was a year that I'd been working on it, and so he knew that if he did that to me, it wouldn't be an outright firing or grievance that he could right. that could be brought against him. But he knew he would break my spirit, which he did. It, it made me. I sat in the parking lot. I called my wife at the time, and I told her the story. And she said, "I think it's it's time to let this go." What would have been a strategic, like as in a ch say in a chess move, if you weren't as emotionally attached to it? What would have been a way that you look back on it? Like, okay, I could have actually done this to counter. Well, I wouldn't have made the trip out. I wouldn't have made the trip out. I would have said I'm not going out there till I, you know, I want the editing room back here or something. You can't fight those guys. They own the movie. Sure, sure. So, I mean, I did, I, you know, I had a meeting with an, a, re, a big director at the time who t told me some things that you can do. For one thing he said is when they take the movie away from you, it's inevitable. It happens to almost every movie. Right. That the director loses control during the editing. But the thing you can count on is that the studios don't have any better ideas than you do. Um, and they don't really want to edit. They don't enjoy the work. You know, you, it's your idea. You have the creativity right. and you like it. 
They don't like it, and they don't know how to do it. So they'll just, to be protective and, uh, you know, territorial, they'll take it away from you. Let them take it. Don't fight it. It's like if a dog is biting you, they tell you don't pull your hand away because you'll actually tear your hand right. on the teeth. What you do is you push your hand further into the dog's mouth. I've never heard that before. Yeah, wow. because then you're not, you're not tug- tugging on the teeth that are in your skin causes tears instead of just a puncture. But if you push your hand into the dog's mouth, it'll actually have to open its mouth wider. So you wow. push your hand in, like punching the dog in the face while it's, uh, you know. The ball's um, on the first guy to discover that. <laughs> <laughs> to have the, to have the fucking low heart rate enough to do that. But uh, you have to do that in those moments of stress. You have to go, I'm not going to tug and j- right. jerk back. I'm going to either push in towards the trouble or I'm going to just keep calm and let it bite me and just and just take it. And that's the best way. They say, we want the film. And you go, okay. Here's the reels. Here's my notes. Go ahead. Because what's going to happen is they're going to give it to some young executive for two weeks. He's going to do an edit, and he's going to get all excited and show it to the exe- to the big guys. And they're going to go, what the fuck did you do? This movie's worse now. Yeah. Give it back to the director. And then the, that executive will actually come to you, please help me. <laughs> please, you know. He, he foresaw that. And there was a version of that that happened. They did reshoots on Pootie Tang, and they asked me to direct the reshoots. Oh wow! Because they didn't know another way to go. I had made something that was pretty unique, and nobody knew how to handle it. So, is it embarrassing at all? Like, because again, as as comics, we kind of get used to. Like you said, you're used to bombing. We get used to. Yeah. But is it embarrassing when, like, you know, the whole cast sees a certain thing, and, mm-hmm. and you're like, you know, they've taken it from you. Do you feel like, ugh, like I don't want to face those people, or do you? Yeah, feel there's like- a lot of hu- humiliation in it. I mean, when I did Pootie Tang. Uh, by the time it was finished, I was disgusted with the whole thing, and I was also a pariah, like I was not hireable as a director. It ruined my filmmaking career. A good example of that is, is I haven't been hired as a director since then. Um, I directed one movie that's not a good record. It's better to do, do two. Do you know what I mean? Right, right. Um, year 2000, I made Pootie Tang. It's 2011. I've never directed again. But what that's how much it hurt me. But at the time, when it was coming out, I remember... It was so humiliating. It was so hard. The pressure was so much because I something was out there that I didn't like. I got an email on my website back when we had like community boards on our websites. Yeah. You know, somebody wrote me yeah, and yeah. said, "Do you like? Should I go see Pootie Tang?" It was coming out in a few days, and I wrote back and I said, "I don't know. I haven't seen it because in truth I hadn't right, seen right, the right. cut." So that was my response. I haven't seen it. Somebody at Paramount who was trolling my website saw this and they got scared by that. That they had over breached, they had taken me taken too much advantage. <laughs> so they got worried. I think of the DGA, the Directors Guild. So they wrote me and said, "Please come watch the movie." And they gave me another first class ticket to come out and gave me a screening room at Paramount to watch the movie. And I flew out there um, and went to a screening room, and nobody like it was weird. Nobody was around. It's like they cleared the yeah. streets, the the hallways at Paramount, so nobody would have to talk to me. And I sat, because John Goldwyn, who ran Paramount, hated me. He hated the movie. He hated me. He was he was royally angry at the movie. Um, but anyway, so I sat in the theater and I watched it, and it made me sick. I just hated, you just hated what you saw. Hated it. Hated what they did with it. And I uh, knew it was coming out that day. It was, that was opening day. And um, I remember David Gale, who ran MTV Films. I think he still does. Yeah. They were partly involved. He's the only guy. He in front, like, just walked over and shook my hand and said, "I'm glad to see." You. He was the only guy who pretended to be my friend in the past who kept pretending to be my friend, or was. I really liked that guy, and he and he gave me. He brought me a review from Elvis Mitchell, who was writing for the New York Times at the time. He, he found one review from him, and he loved the movie. Oh wow! So I got to experience for five minutes. Before I saw the film, before I saw it, the, his review, and I was really happy for five minutes about it. Then I watched it, yeah. and I was like, this is shit. And then all the reviews started coming out. Hateful, hateful, piles and piles of hateful reviews. And then, you know, uh, Rope, what's his name? E- Ebert. Rod- uh, yeah, Cisco Ebert, yeah. Roger. Roger Ebert, who I grew up watching on sneak previews on PBS uh, till before it was even a big show. Um, said this movie's not even bad. It's not complete. It's not a movie. Like he didn't even give it the respect to pan it. He said I can't review this movie. It's not. It's not a film. 
and he was right. He actually said something really smart, which was he said, it looks like people took pieces of a movie someone else made and manufactured this strange product out of it. And that's exactly what they had done. They took my movie that I had made and they put it together. But anyway, so so it was hard to have a movie out that was getting panned with my name on it. I had the option to take my name off of it, but I didn't because I, I felt it was my responsibility. Right. That it was bad. It's part of your job as a director. Two of Louis C.K. on Raw Dog, Sirius 104, XM 150. I'm always interested with you because there's been things you've done that have worked and there's been things that haven't worked. And it's like to see you now where you are with a show that's working very well and with selling out fucking 4,000 seats everywhere. You... Lucky Louis. Yeah. Lucky, which obviously we did together, and yeah. one of my favorite projects I've ever done. I thought it, it yeah, was me too. really funny, Yeah, and it deserved mm -hmm. season two. It didn't happen. Yeah. No. What happened? What, like People always say, why didn't Lucky Louie come back? And I, I don't know what to tell them, because it's like, mm -hmm. well, I guess you get married to something, and you feel like sometimes you think something's better than it was because we're close to it, Yeah. but enough people have said to me, like, what the fuck happened? Why didn't that... Right. Come back. What was the reason they gave? I mean, it had a lot of viewers. Well, I, it did. It it got more viewers than a, the, a lot of the shows that followed it. Um, never touched our ratings. Right. We had great ratings, and um, they increased all the time. Yep. I used to get those reports all the time because I'm fascinated by the business part of television. I don't look at it like I'm not a person who's like, hey, man, I'm an artist. And uh, all those money guys can do what they want. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm fucking fascinated by how people make money yeah. on TV and films. So I love looking at numbers and analyzing them. So I used to get the raw number reports from HBO. And they were always extremely positive. Like, the only nights that our, our ratings increased every night, every week. And the only nights that they went down was because we were on Sunday nights. Whenever there was uh, big football nights, right. like in the playoffs, we would take a big hit. But so would the entire HBO Sunday night lineup. And our show would lose less than everybody else. We would lose less a percentage of our viewers than Entourage would. Like, Entourage was more boy-heavy. We had a more mixed audience. We were really a promising show for them. And uh, Surprisingly large black crowd, too. I've actually had black people, and very rarely in my yeah, career, they like it. love the show, yelling out the car window, yeah. Lucky Louie. It's amazing. The fucking cast of The Wire used to watch uh, yeah. Lucky Louie. No, it never ends, either. People stop me on the street all the time. I get more recognition for that than anything else. And uh, the show really hit a chord with people. Yeah. It came at a weird time. It came when HBO was starting to change. Everybody, if you notice, everybody who worked at HBO when we did Lucky Louie is gone now. Every one of them. It's the, it's the way that... It's because I was attached to it. Everybody that <laughs> likes me dies. It, they just go away. You know what? I had that time. I had a time like that. That's a pretty good... When you look at a career, that's a pretty good... That's a good cusp time that you're starting to get at projects as they're dying. You know, like Ron Perlman described today that he was on, he was on the last right. movie of franchises. And that's... That's a good sign that you're headed in the right direction, I think, honestly. But uh, HBO, uh, no, they. I thought we were coming back because they paid me and Mike Royce, my partner, uh, to hang around for it. Like, they gave us each, like, $100,000 just to not take other jobs. Right. Like, just th threw money at us. We had Kim Hawthorne, who played the neighbor, the black yeah, neighbor. Yeah, yeah, she was great. She called me one day and said, uh, I got offered a pilot on a drama. I had no deal with Kim Hawthorne. She was really smart. She did our show as a day player. Like, nobody had made a deal with her, but she became, she played her way on the, the team. She was like a player, a rookie who has right. no contract, and the next year you got to pay big sure. money. She was so valuable to the show, and we had no deal with her, and she wanted to leave to, for, a money, for more money. And so I called HBO. This is when we heard the season for one was finished. Yeah. And I called HBO and said, I don't want to lose Kim Hawthorne. So they just wrote her a check for $50,000. Just to keep her. Just to stay away from the other pilot, which is wasted money. We never made a season two. They hired, uh, they let me hire a bunch of writers. I had replaced a lot of my writing staff with new writers. And they paid my writing staff to sit in a room and generate eight scripts. They bought eight scripts of that show that we, we wrote eight new episodes that were paid for by HBO, and they floated the writing staff to uh, punch them up everything. Um, so I had every reason to think we were coming back. Uh, the reviews, everybody says it was panned, but other people will say it was critically acclaimed, because if you actually go through the reviews, there were loads of great reviews, and most credible papers reviewed it well. The New York Times, LA Times, Tom Shales, all the Chicago papers, New York Daily News, uh, Village Voice... Uh, tons of big papers loved the show. 
and then a whole shitload of bloggers and places like USA Today hated it. Um, TV Guide hated it. All those kind of people. Yeah, Entertainment Weekly, all those shits. Yeah, Entertainment Weekly shit all over it. And also, uh, you know, the, the one that bothered me the most, and it's like, and I I do read negative press. You know, yeah, they I say we too. shouldn't. It's like it's hard well, not. Why to. not? Why wouldn't you? I know. Somebody writes a hateful thing about you and that's published. Well, who the fuck are you not to read? Exactly. It? What kind of a fucking <laughs> Teflon person? Doesn't sit down and read that shit. People just say that do. to take the sting out of the critics. They, they try yeah, to make the critics that's feel exactly not as right. Important. It's always I don't read my reviews. Yes, you Everyone fucking does. do. You're the first to read them. Linda Stassi from the Post annoyed me. Not uh, people who thought it just wasn't funny. I don't like the writing. I don't like the acting. Right. Any of that's legit. Like you don't think mm -hmm. something's funny? You don't think it's funny. But when they started attacking the set design or the language, yeah. meanwhile they didn't attack the language in the fucking in, in the Sopranos no. or any of the other stuff. That's what started to drive me nuts because you knew it was something else. Well, you know. I don't look at anything as pure negative, and I don't think I don't expect candy like positive out of things. I knew that show was an experiment, and I knew it was something to put out there and see how people react. And I loved every reaction, including Linda Stasi. Really, that I thought she was it, it, she totally missed the point with the set. Yeah, like she, I, me, and Chris Albrecht. Remember him? I love Chris. Chris Albrecht, the president of HBO at the time. He called me when we were laughing about some of the bad reviews, and he thought the funniest thing were people like her who made fun of how drab the set was. That it was an extremely calculated and deliberate thing to make the set really basic and 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 theatrical looking that was a decision yeah. we made and he thought it was funny that people like her would say the sets are so bad he, and because he was saying like he wanted to call her and say you really think that we just missed the mark with the set you hbo which has some of the most beautiful opulent shows just fucking gorgeous set design they're doing things about queen elizabeth whatever i don't know all the things they were doing at the time but on this show, we just overlooked the set. Design. You really think like we hired a shitty set designer because we're not good yeah. producers? Like HBO would make a show like that without a reason. Um, so when she wrote that, so yeah, I didn't ever cared about that. I, I, but I was fascinated by it that some people just thought, and and other people that like Barbara Walters and all these people who said it was offensive because yeah. we're using bad language, where. We were following a show, this show Entourage, which was, I remember one of the episodes of Entourage that preceded us, they have a friend of theirs over who's a pri who just got out of prison, and he's anally fucking a girl, like, who doesn't look like she's enjoying it right. in one scene, and you see his balls, and she's fucking, he's fucking this girl in the ass, and they're rolling their eyes like, there goes him again, and that, no one's ever says they're offended by Entourage, right. nobody. Sopranos, HBO's Crown Jewel, which is about a guy who murders people yep. every day and cheats on his wife every day. Here is our show. We are a married couple, faithful to each other, trying to give each other pleasure in bed. I'm trying to give her an orgasm to make her happy. And um, people like Barbara Walters called that offend. They are offended by that. But when you explain it like that, like you're, to me, one of your greatest gifts is your ability to logically explain. You have the greatest logic of, I think anybody I've ever spoken to. Explain like that. Yeah. Who can? How can anybody be offended after hearing that type of an explanation? Well, because you don't get to precede your shows with a soliloquy. That's about right. the context. <laughs> I really am a you naive eight-year-old. I mean? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like every time I've edited, when you put together... But it's a good question, because when you put together shows, whenever I've edited something with someone else, which one of the reasons I love doing my show is that I edit it myself, because when you edit with somebody and they're doing something that's not working... And you go, that's... Or when somebody shows me something of theirs, like if I have a friend who's doing a TV show and they show me a cut of it, and I go, I didn't... This part was confusing. I'm not getting that. And then they explain it to me. No, see, this is from before when he did the thing and that when I showed that. And I always say to them, well, as long as you're sitting next to every viewer <laughs> giving that explanation, then go ahead and cut it that way. But people take stuff in in this raw way. And most people don't really remember what they saw, and most people don't really take in. They take in about 60% of what they're watching. So I think it, the context of Lucky Louie was that no show looked like it. No one knew why the fuck we would make a show that looks like that. And no one had ever seen a show that had a basic three-camera family format where we would say cunt and fuck. Um, too, by the way, I went back and forth with the critic because the laughs were so 
booming. Yes. That people thought, and this is one of the things I loved about you, is that you would never sweeten, and you did not, uh, like, a lot of times we would do a joke, it didn't work. Yeah. And you'd come to me and go, all right, what do you got? Let's try something else. We would try something else. Sometimes that would work. Sometimes it wouldn't. But you always left it. If the joke didn't get a nine, you left it as a six. You, yeah. you didn't change. Those were be. real laughs. Well, a show is supposed to have a ebb and flow. Any scene in any show should have a quiet part, a loud part, explosions, parts where you come back a little bit. Um, it's like watching a baseball game. You're watching a game develop. You're watching the show, you know, you're watching a guy's at bat develop. You're watching him work the count to three and one, whatever it is. And then you know, wow, there's potential now because there's three and mm. one. Oh, fuck, he missed. So now we're now both, now it's even potential. You're watching this. And then when the guy hits a home run, it's a huge victory. Um, but the way people make TV now is that they just wanted to. I mean, what would it be like if every baseball game was just h home runs? Right, right, right. Home runs, home runs. There, no, not even outs. Just till everybody gets tired and goes home. Yeah, the, it's boring. So to me, a show should have this natural feeling to it, which our show did. Our it, you, show, a scene would develop, some parts would work, some parts wouldn't, some parts would explode, and it would mean something. Instead of this, every TV show now just has even exactly the same laugh for every joke. Ha 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 ha! It's unwatchable to it's me. It's awful. But it is what TV has been. And had been when Lucky Louie came on, what was that, 2005? I, uh, it might have been six, or five or six. Yeah, it might have been five. So I'm going to say there was a good 25 years of TV made exactly the same way. Um, how the fuck do you beat that? I mean, how, how do you come on and not be seen as just a jarring, strange... And pe intelligent people didn't understand it. Intelligent people said, there's a laugh track. I mean, we even had... Uh, us saying, like in they, when they did in Happy Days, when Happy Days came on, there was a credibility problem for sitcoms because of the laugh track. They had overused the laugh track. So uh, Gary Marshall on on the uh, three's what do you not three's company Happy Days Happy Days and Laverne and Shirley they had one of the characters say Happy Days was filmed before a live audience. They said it out loud. Yes. They didn't even print it. They said it out loud to make sure you knew that they're not fucking that these laughs are real. We did the same thing. We felt like we needed to do the same Pam thing. Pam would do it, right? Pam Adler. Pamela did it. I did it. Did you ever do one? I, I never did, you did one, no. One. And then we did that, and people would, fucking professional TV reviewers would watch the show, hear that with their ears, and they would write canned laughter. You know what's too, and this is what they didn't see, is a lot of times before the show, you'd go out and talk to the audience, and I remember you saying something to the effect of, don't laugh if you don't think it's funny. If you think it's funny, laugh. If you don't think it's funny, don't laugh. You really, you, you kind of told the crowd it was okay just to relax and react naturally, which to me just makes people feel comfortable to laugh. Well, I still say that when I film stand-up for my show now, because a lot of my show has stand com me doing stand-up at the club, right. at the Comedy Cellar, I tell that audience, you have because every audience thinks they're an actor in the show. But they're supposed like because you do you go to like Letterman or TV tapings and yeah. they tell you to really go nuts, and I don't think anything sickens me more than manufactured <sighs> enthusiasm. Uh, people when you know oh, this guy, Woo! and they all go fucking bananas. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> if you let your left out of it. You know, I don't think anyone. I mean, like when I remember when I did hilarious. Well, the first time I did it, I produced my own special was chewed up and the producers said we want you to look like you're a rock star when you walk on that stage and i said why i'm not i'm a comedian and i don't when i'm watching something i don't like like dane's special vicious circle when yeah. it comes out to bought and there's pe there's a stadium of people cheering him on if you're a new viewer and you don't know who this guy is you're like, well, I, I guess this is some party I missed because, you know, I just want to watch a person go on and earn their credibility from scratch. So I tell the audiences at the Comedy Cellar, don't, uh, don't, don't have it. You're here because you, I'm doing a show for you. You're the audience. So make me earn it. Don't, uh, don't laugh if it's not funny. I also feel embarrassed when they're too hyped up and I walk out. I'm like, yeah, there's stupid. no way I'm going to live up to this. No. And I know you were put up to it. Yeah. Exactly. When they do a special, I went bananas when they were, I just used it, shooting uh, for HBO, yeah. and they were having, uh, we were doing Down and Dirty, and they were having the audiences laugh. Give us a laugh, and oh, the yeah, crowd no, you, laughs. That's the worst thing in the world. And I've had I've had fights with them oh. about that, that they want to get laughs for editing purposes. If you can't edit a concert uh, without those extra laughs, you're a fucking moron. It's hard. It's a, it's a challenge. Like, I've had moments where you're trying to make an edit in a special that 
doesn't that's got a hiccup in it because there's and you go find a piece of a laugh somewhere else to use and yeah. or a piece of applause and it never ends up working anyway you end up just doing another cut but when they do that to an audience they make an audience feel like assholes and they lose a lot of your credibility before you come out because then they just um, then, then the reaction becomes almost like like when someone pokes you you go ow it, it's almost yeah. like ah they understand the rhythm of the punchline yes and it's not fucking natural they're not listening anymore this is the Jim Norton interview of Louis C K on Raw Dog Sirius one hundred four XM one fifty your new show is obviously a hit and it's it's so encouraging to see that because it's like. You you, you you didn't clean up. You didn't fucking change no. who you are. Mm. You're still the same fucking despicable yes. wretch. And yes. it's like you're doing it, I was say your way, but you're doing what you want to do, and it's fucking working, man. And it's like, yeah. what inside of you gives you the fucking ability to do that and not just go, I fuck this, I'm humiliated, I can't do it? Well, it's again, it's every failure I've ever had because I've, I have failed hard, and I've been, I've been the center of negative attention. Um at least twice with Pootie Tang and Lucky Louie. Yeah. There's a lot of people that enjoyed trashing that show. Yeah, they did, right? It was fucking irritating. And there was people that attacked it unnecessarily. I remember after we were on the air for eight months, mm -hmm. um, we had weathered the storm. There was this feeling like we had our bad reviews, we had our good reviews, and with that information, the American public is deciding to watch the show. We were going, we are growing. And then a reviewer here in New York, David Abanculli. Scumbag. He didn't review the show. The Daily News, his paper, had reviewed it with another reviewer who said positive things yeah. about it. He didn't write a review and analyzing the show, which I think is what critical writing is supposed to be, analysis of, write, of art. I think it's a legitimate field sure. to be an expert in television, watch TV shows, and then write an analysis. When you cr Critics are supposed to do this. Write what the show is, is like. Describe it from a professional point of view. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Not just a viewer, but here's the kind... This is what this show is. It. I don't think it works because of these reasons. Here's the historical context of it. It's much like this show, much like this other. Here's what I think they're trying to do. Here's where I think they fail. Right. But he didn't do that. He wrote one of these... Re reviewers believe that they should be affecting how TV's made, and they think they, they should, you know, they like that power. So he wrote an article that the gist of it was HBO needs to cancel Lucky Louie, even though it only has four episodes left, and even though HBO doesn't need to cancel shows because they don't sell advertising. Mm -hmm. If you have a show that's ratings are poor, the advertisers are losing money, so you have to cancel it before it's finished. Do you know what I mean? Sure. HBO is a subscription service, right. and it doesn't have a reason to cancel. There's by canceling a show, um, and our reading ratings were increasing. So David Bianculli wrote, "They should cancel the show to make a statement that they know the show is a mistake," and he put people's fucking jobs on the line. He doesn't. You know what I mean? If you don't like a show, that's one thing. And if you write and pr trumpet your hatred for a show, you're welcome to do it. But there are people who like it, and there yeah. are people who are making it, and it's their life. Like, it was just, to me, it was like a way overstepping. Like, who the fuck needs to read this? Didn't he get, he, he's not with the Daily News I don't know, anymore. I have no idea. I think he, I think, I think he was uh, fired or he might be a guy who I'd read something else of his that I would, but he took this. No, I detest him. I, I hope he's a lump somewhere. No reason to fucking write that. And and I wrote him in an email telling him that I objected and then I erased it. I've done that a lot. Sure. I've written a lot of angry emails and erased them just as a way to get it out. But uh, anyway, I, you asked me some a long time ago. The point is, I've been the center of attention of negative attention a couple of times. I've I've had my worst nightmare come true, and I survived it. It didn't hurt me as badly as I thought it would, and indeed, there I I gained every time, gained hugely, and I wouldn't trade those bad experiences right. for anything. So what that tells me is when I start trying something, the bad version of it, I could take it. Like I have no fear because I've my worst fears have been realized, and it wasn't, it wasn't so bad. It, it would be like if you. If you started boxing and you're like, I'm afraid to get punched in the face, anybody is. And your first few times you get punched in the face, you're like, I don't hate this. Right. And I'm good at the boxing. And I'm not dead. I'm not dead. I don't hate it. And I'm I'm succeeding uh, sometimes. Why? This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> do. You know what I mean? And you have complete control here. Oh, at FX is totally unbridled control. 
but it comes with good. I mean, it's it comes with credibility. I, I have also I've had failures, but I've turned shit out. And by the way, the two failures that I've had have both, in my view, been vindicated by people watching. People still watch Lucky Louie, yep. and people still love Pootie Tang. Was trending on Twitter a couple weeks ago, like right. it was all over the place. Really? Yeah, never stop. I mean, everybody, every great. Uh, musician that I've been near has come up to me. Jack uh, uh, White, is that his name? Yeah, yeah. Came up to me and said, "Pootie, uh, it's all I do is watch Pootie." Oh wow. Um, that so so I, I have credibility. That's why that's how I got this thing. Is they know they're not going to. In the end, it's all money. They, there, there's a lot of comedians and artists who actually throw money away, who make pilots that are like, I can't even put this on TV. That was a huge waste of money. Uh, but I'm not. I don't ask them for a lot of money, and I know what I'm doing. So, but you're one of these guys, though. It's like everybody says, like they want to do their own thing and think out of the box. But you really do things differently. Like it's it's like you, you told we were on Opie and Anthony uh, earlier today together, and you were talking about how your daughters. You had two different girls play your daughters. Yeah. Nobody fucking does that. Yeah. Like, nobody doesn't care. If the daughter's not signed for next year. Right. Nobody has ever not right. given a shit about that. I only get excited by thoughts like that, by having to make up for a terrible mistake. I only find that exciting. I get. I, I guess I have kind of an, of an impish part of me that when I start making a decision that I know is going to upset people or confuse people, I get a little excited inside that they're going to get upset and that I may have to explain myself. Uh, but also, I just think there's other things that are more important when I'm making something. It's more important to have the ease. If you give a kid a TV contract for a whole year, you're just, you have to use that kid every show. Right. I thought maybe I may not even keep these kids in the show. I may dump both of them. I just want to be able to do that. It's better for the show that the show have no obligations to any single person. Because then you do, you are forced to write interactions between characters that you normally wouldn't. You'd probably rather go somewhere yeah. else in that episode. It's like, no, oh, no, exactly. i got to have fucking Ted and Steve talk about something. Yes. No, you have to. I mean, it's even more so in network TV. I was on a, a Parks and Rec when I was doing a, a little part in that show, and they have these two characters on the show. I was watching them shoot a scene where two characters met in the hallway, said shitty jokes to each other, and then kept walking. Shitty jokes on purpose or just shitty network? Shitty, well, jokes, no, they were bad jokes, not because the, the writers on the show were excellent. Okay. There just wasn't any, it, they were empty jokes. Just trite right. things. And then they then they shot it again and again and again and trying different combinations of jokes. It was taking for, it was taking more time than the Pearl, the were great stuff they were shooting with right. Amy Poehler and the other, and Aziz and those people that were really good on the show. And I asked one of the writers, why is this timing wasted? And they said, because these two characters don't really have a role in this episode they don't have there's nothing for them to do so we're just servicing them we're just we needed a scene for them because they're heavily paid heavily they're in the opening credits so we need but there's no reason for it so so that's why it's hard to write when you don't have any real goal <laughs> except to put two faces on a fucking screen it was such a dumb waste of time and it hurt the episode it was a speed bump in the show like why am I watching these two fuckers my show has no obligation to anybody and no obligation to telling a cohesive story. It, I, I only show, to me, the big rule in my head is I only show things that are worth watching. If I'm, watch, if I'm, showing, if, if I'm finding myself writing a scene because I think it's information the audience needs, in TV and films you call this laying pipe. Laying pipe is when characters are saying stuff in order for this audience to understand. Right, right, right. And they call it laying pipe because it never, and they're never things that you would say. But Charlie, you promised your wife that you would never give her a surprise party. Right, right. Charlie, you're my brother. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. This is laying pipe, oh. but there's sometimes there's scenes that are just pipe laying. You know what? Oh my God! I just got a phone call that says this. But how are you going to do that? I don't know. I better come up with a thing and then musical intro to the next to starting the fun right, part. Right, right, right. It takes sometimes two or three scenes to get to anything entertaining. And the writers will tell you that we needed all that investment for the audience to uh, appreciate what happens. Um, I, I am a firm believer that that's all bullshit. Audiences are much smarter than you think they are, and they'll catch up to shit. Uh, in my show, you just launch a scene. You're just in it. And you don't know why. You don't know who anybody is in the scene often. 
and you catch up to, oh, oh, they're playing poker. Oh, who's that guy? I don't fucking know who these people are. I'm just watching. And then you see, uh, I'm starting to see who's talking more. I'm starting to see who's more important. Oh, I guess he's not as important as right. I thought. You know, you watch and you move with it. That's how people take life in, too, you know? So um, if there's a scene I'm writing because it's exposition, I just take it out. And if there's something I really want to show, but it doesn't fit, I put it in anyway. Like, that's the other thing that TV writers do is if you come up with an idea in a writer's room that's fucking brilliant, like everybody goes, that would be so great. Right. Somebody, <laughs> everyone says, that would be great, that would be great. And then somebody in the room goes, doesn't fit the story, though. Doesn't make any sense. And then you'll work all night trying to make it work because everybody wants it. Okay, what's the logical way for us to get to that moment? There isn't one. And then you take it out. And people don't get to see that cool idea because no one could justify it in the in the logical context of a story. I, and I, I kind of stuff breaks my heart. And you have to make a decision on what... Now, would it actually be entertaining or is it just something that the writers like in the room that in the context of the story would look weird? Yeah, but if some you like know it. when you come up with something like, oh, fuck, that would be great to see yeah. that. You just know. Um, and it kills television. And writers rooms think that they're perfect they perfect scripts and they ruin tv shows in the process that's what i think happens do you think we're, i find the dialogue i was watching a show on showtime recently and the dialogue was ba -da -da, ba -da -da, very snappy patterish yes Seriously, nobody talks real on television there's no organic dialogue and no organic no. speech patterns it's all fucking it's all it's all clipped tv talk yeah it is and it's it's arrogant because what it is it's it's a lot of uh, you know I'm, I'm being an asshole here but there's a lot of collegiate tv writers who don't You're right who just want people to sound a certain way and who don't want the audience to weigh in and they don't want to let moments linger and you know um, but there's a way that unfunny people make funny that they're like this is I'm in a comedy right now I'm in a comedy right now that's what I always want people to say in sitcoms Neil, that, Neil Patrick Harris and that uh, every, you know I'm a smarmy character yeah you better watch what I say because it's you know he just everything he's saying yeah. is dripping with this fake comedy thing he he wins these Emmys for comedy he's completely unfunny I, I, I don't that's my that's my opinion of his work I have no idea. He might be the greatest guy in the world. I don't care. But yeah. um, there's there's a lot of comedy that's work that's just like, the, we're doing this. Like, I remember on Lucky Louie once, we changed dialogue on the set. Me and Pamela rewrote something that came to the floor, which was certainly my prerogative. It was Your show. my show. Yeah. And one of the writers took offense that we changed something. And I'm like, what do you? what's your problem? And he said, we worked hard on that dialogue. We vetted it. The uh, writing staff vetted the dialogue. He actually said that? Yes. And uh, so it was disrespectful for you to throw it away. To me, the idea of vetting, you know what vetting means? I only yeah, but not in the writing sense. Well, vetting, uh, like if you vet... I was, by the way, honest, I would have said, what does that mean? But I wanted to just... Yeah, no, the I, mean, I, I knew what I was talking about. I looked it up after he said this to me. <laughs> vet, the only time I ever heard vetting was in the con political context. When they pick a VP right. or something, they vet him, and was, they, they, they analyze, find everything out they can about him, and then they, then, you know, they, they scrutinize. So when you vet dialogue, it's the same thing. You, you look at a page of dialogue... And you analyze every line. Is this giving us all the information we need? Is this upping the stakes? Is this giving the character a motive? Yes, and we all approve as a, in a Congress of a writing yeah. staff, and we send it to the floor. And this fucking asshole career funny man who gave us all this job had the balls to just put his own feeling into it about what he thought it should sound like. <laughs> you know, it's just... But that's what a lot of TV writers are like they think that, that it's they think that there's this science to it that and it, it's not even a science it's just a bullshit craft and Americans are forced to watch this shit over and over again Keith Robinson who you know is a comic from the cell had a great way of putting it we were talking about guys that aren't funny and a lot of them some writers are funny guys and some aren't mm -hmm. but he was talking about front of the bus and back of the bus guys yeah. and not in a tough guy sense but in a goofball you know right. if you're in the back of the bus you're talking shit you're being an asshole yes and so a lot of those writers they're front of the bus guys and a lot yes. of not all but a lot of the alt comics and some of them are actually very funny but the ones that aren't are those people in the front of the bus where they try to find a formula to be funny mm -hmm. but they're not organically funny people there's nothing funny about a lot of those right. writers when you talk to them it's funny because a lot of alt comics would say the opposite they would think of themselves as the back of the bus and they would think as they would think of well formed and well trained and 
and solid comedians like Keith as a front of the bus, the bus guy. That's funny to me. I would put uh, him, Keith in the back of the bus yeah. because he's black. And I have, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, Keith... Uh, Keith is, by the way, one of my favorite comics. Oh, is he a funny severely fucking dude? Severely underrated. Yeah. Every time I see him, he has a new bit, and it's funny. And here's why he's underrated, because he's fucking lazy, and he yes. won't do certain things. No, because he won't put himself out there. But I know. As, as a guy, too, Keith yeah. is sickeningly funny. Uh, he's an abusively funny yeah. fucking dude. He, yeah. He's like sit on the corner and make people laugh. No, he's dude. great. He's great. No, and, and with Lucky Louie, the idea was putting just performers on a stage and getting them to do stuff. That's why the, write, the writing, the, the writing, vetting, and perfectioning is, is part of what made the show have a mixed message. And I mean, I th I, in some ways, I don't blame people for not having liked it because we didn't do it completely the way I wanted to. We, we did it about 60% of what I wanted, and the rest of it, I trusted other people. And I don't blame them. They're, they, th those writers did what they were trained to do. And uh, they probably are succeeding at it in other shows. They were all very talented. I had a great writing yeah. staff. It just wasn't a writing staff show. I would never write with a staff again. When I you would write never do that. When you write now, because, again, you, you have an interesting way of thinking and doing things. Do you start, like, all right, I want my story to be this, and I'm going to finish here? Or do you just kind of throw out a bunch of different ideas and say, I'm going to put these together somehow at the end? It, everything, every one, every, every episode is different in that sense. Some of them I, I know... Like, I have a flash of an idea, and it's a whole episode. Like, I did this episode about religion, and I knew that would be a whole episode. I wanted to tell the, this entire story of this kid and that I let be me just to give it a context that meant anything. Um, being so scared of Catholicism and, 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 and being uh, sympathetic to Jesus and wanting to help him instead of just letting him hang there. Um, that to me was such a fascinating story, and then bringing my mom into it and all that stuff. I knew that was going to be a whole episode, and I, I knew it by the time I was. I mean, I, I almost thought the whole episode out in one thought, you know, and then I just sat down and wrote it. Uh, there are other things where I do one bit that's just a shred, like I, I you know, um, I want to see this happen, and then other shreds come together and it ends up making a whole show it depends other things come with start with one moment like the bully episode that i did where this bu kid, high school bully picks on me and that episode sometimes this happens that story told itself to me instead of me telling the story sometimes you f you know what i mean when you follow your imagination mm -hmm. down a road and you don't even think you're in right. control of it yeah i had the f one moment in my head which is i'm on a date and i get picked on by a kid and I realize I can't this is real life I can't fight him I'm a four, I'm over 40 I'm not going to fight him and I'll say whatever it takes to get him away from me that's the safe road why wouldn't I do I'm not in a mood I'm not I'm a human being <laughs> yeah but uh, there's a girl with me and she wanted I was trying to have sex with her so I just told myself that moment I said so what happens and then I first step was her complete humiliation of me and saying you just turned me off completely. And then I thought, but what if I, what would I do? Would I follow the kid home and beat the shit out of him? Would I get revenge on the kid? Um, and then I just told myself, I want to follow him all the way home. I want to follow him. Up. I want the audience to be like, what's he doing? This is crazy. And I didn't know where it was going. And the story just took me to, there's his house. I walk up, who would I meet? Well, he's a kid. I'd meet his parents. What would I say to them? I'd tell on them. That's what adults do when other kids have their problem with somebody's kids. What would they do? Beat the shit out of them. How would I react? I'd say, hey, cut it out. You shouldn't hit kids. That's why he's like this. And I was telling this story to Pamela, who is a consultant yes. producer on my show, Pamela Adlon, that played, I'm just saying it for them. Sure, sure. Played uh, Kim on Lucky Louie, my wife. I was telling her this story. I was hatching it in front of her. And I said, so I'm yelling at the father and saying, you shouldn't hit your kid. And that's why he's like this. And then she says, and then the wife, the mom goes, get out of here, you fucking queer. <laughs> like she, <laughs> she did this funny voice. And she said, then the mother starts slapping you. And I fucking howled laughing. She finished that for me. And so we went out and cast a woman with that voice. And we did the whole <laughs> thing. It was great. Uh, so sometimes it's like that. It's all of a piece, and it starts with one little, I want to see this moment. And rather than set up, like, have a phone call, I call the girl up, you know, I right. start a date, I go, who are these kids? Why are they like this? Da, 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 you know, I just, here's the moment. 
sometimes it looks totally different than other episodes. Like, I like the show to feel different almost visually every episode. The music's different depending on what we feel like showing. Um, what do you do when you have a thought that you want to articulate? Like, there's been things I'm, I'm writing that I can't, like, I know what I want it to be, but I just, I fucking sit down, I just mm. can't, I just can't articulate a certain piece. It's That's very, really hard. It's frustrating. Yes, I have a thousand great ideas that I've thought, I've gotten flush in the face with excitement. This is going to be so good. And I write down the note, write this yeah. idea. And then when I sit down, okay, I'm going to write. And I start interior bedroom day and it won't come out of me like I can't make it happen what do you just go back to it like you know I'll write something down sometimes, sometimes back to it. I keep it on a card and I go I know there's something valuable there and I couldn't sit down and write it once I started making the scene there's a few ways I've approached that moment some of them you get this sick feeling in your stomach like I can't write this or you start writing and it found sounds fake and you stop I can't do something I don't enjoy that's why I can only do a show like this. If I was working on a show where I'm kind of like rolling my eyes and plowing through it, I would kill myself. And that's not a good thing. I think a right. responsible human being does things, grits their teeth and does stuff. Right. But if I'm writing a bit that's not inspired and that I'm not driven to write, that's not flowing out of me, I just stare at the page for a while. Sometimes I'll start writing bad dialogue and then let it catch up to itself and get better. Right, right. Sometimes just having it written out, I'm like, good, I have it. It's not good, but I ha it exists. And I could go back and fix it. Because it's easier to go back and edit something or fix something than it is to actually just conceptualize something. Like I don't know that, that passion that's true. is gone. I don't know that that's true. Really? I think sometimes when you write stuff, it has a, ten a ten tendency to gel, to harden, so that you can't make fix it again. See, I like to edit because I, I have an emotion when I write anything. It's mm -hmm. like it has to just kind of come out there, and then I can go back and fix it. But it's hard to recapture the emotion or the excitement sometimes. It is. That's that's a huge part of what we do. And a lot of times, like with stand up. If you if a bit killed most bits that really kill kill because of the feeling you put behind them right. because of the way you're being because you're animated by the thought not by the perfect pausing or whatever you did that stuff that stuff comes out of your exp the way you expressed it it comes from a feeling but when you know when you do a bit and it's killing so you imprint it you start doing it exactly the same yeah. way every time and then it starts to degenerate yeah it starts to come down oh, yeah and the reason is because you are relying on the mechanics and you've lost the passion behind it and the audience is now laughing at comedy mechanics which are about 50 percent funny totally pure feelings are 100 30 percent funny see that's and so, you just explained something to me like it's, i'm doing Be comedy 20 years and i know that feeling i've had bits. background checks right from your home computer i'm not believing it anymore so they're not believing it but the way you just explained it is fucking perfect well and here's what i've always done when i reach that point and I, and i learned it from an unlikely source who's a, a friend of yours bob krakauer the oh the acting teacher acting, sure, sure acting i love bob teacher. now I, I most of what i learned as an actor on lucky louie i completely discarded i don't think i'd ever do a show that way again the oh i over rehearsed I overprepared um, and overthought it, my acting on that show. Uh, when I do my show now, I don't know my lines usually. I do them exactly as written, but when my first take, I never know it. I like to learn it as I'm doing it. I don't rehearse anything. But anyway, Bob taught me a really valuable thing. He said that if you say a line differently every time you do it, that means you're probably doing it right. Because you're, you're, you're concentrating on the feeling of what you're saying rather than and the intention rather than right. the words and the spacing and stuff and so what I do when I'm doing a bit on stage that starts to lose steam cause and it used to fucking kill cause I always yeah. said and that bitch never shut up whatever yeah. like people I thought people were laughing cause I went that bitch yeah. never I'm just taking on somebody else's act yeah and, um so then I, when it stops getting laughs, I remember, why did I say it? Forget how I said it. Why did I say it? And then I do, I try to pretend I've never said this thought before. I try to pretend like I'm explaining it to somebody for the first time, for my first time, not theirs. And I go, and that bitch never shut up. And the hey, works now again. they're laughing because I'm going up. No, they're not laughing because of either thing. They're laughing because of the because of the intention. And there are definitely comedy mechanics that you learn to use, but there. Well, yeah, there's timing and things that are needed. But but it's like playing piano or guitar. Somebody who's a great uh, somebody who can learn all piano mechanics their whole lives, but if they're not 
uh, Vladimir Horowitz, they're not going to know how to just pound those fucking keys and or when to let up just right. What did Charles Emerson wish yesterday to say in MASH? He said, I could, I, could, uh, I could hit the notes, but I could never make the music, right? <laughs> <laughs> Talking about the piano. <laughs> yes, exactly. You're probably the most interesting guy I know, and, and there's very oh, few people sure. that I can really listen to. It's like I'm asking you questions, and mm-hmm. I don't know how the audience enjoys them, but I'm really mm-hmm. picking your fucking brain, and it's yeah. like... You just you have an amazing way of expressing yourself, which is what makes you a great comic and a great writer and great at everything you do. And thanks, Jim. I'm well, really you're, happy. You're you. of a rare honesty, and uh, I still love watching you on stage. I don't get to see any. You know, after you get to a point where you don't get to see your favorite comics yeah. anymore, and it's sad. Um, but uh, it's funny because I'll always think of you as a new guy. Um, because I was already a veteran when you started, but now you are. You know, you're, yeah. you're one of the kings. So. Thanks, buddy. All right, man. So uh, oh, let's plug too. We have uh, just let's give the plug for the CD too. Yeah, so hilarious is coming out. Hilarious, which was on Epics, is now going to be on Comedy Central, and the DVD and the CD will be out, and it'll be on Netflix. So and season called. one of Louis is on Netflix too, right? So season one of Louis is on Netflix, and it'll be on DVD one. Closer to June, which is when we start season two. All right. Well, thanks, man. It's, thanks. it's always fun to talk. I could, if thanks, I didn't look man. at the clock, I really thought like we'd talk for twenty yeah, minutes. It was fun. But uh, you're, you're just you're brilliant, and. Uh,